Wow, there are uh, a lot of people in here. And <laughs> that was a thunderous clap, so I can go home now. <laughs> Several years ago, during Gallery Hop, which is one of the most prominent events that happens here in Columbus, and if you're not familiar, it's where people come from near and far to attend uh, and patronize shops in the Shore North District of Columbus, Ohio. And we were hosting an event this one year uh, in collaboration with a client of mine. And a guy walks into the event <clears throat> and he's looking around confused and, and wondering what's going on. And I approach him and I say, well, you know, I just wanted to let you know that you're welcome to stay. This is a paint by numbers mural event we do called the Brush Experience. And we would love for you to participate in this paint by numbers event. And so he looks at me confused and begins to uh, look around the room again, kind of scratching his head. And then he looks at me and he, and he says, well, did you invite any white people? <laughs> <laughs> kind of laugh like that. And uh, I said, well, what, what do you mean? He said, well, <clears throat> is this event only for black people? Now, I'm sure he wasn't the only person that walked in that day uh, thinking that, in fact, quite a few white folks had come in the door, and once they saw that there was quite a bit of hue in the room, they uh, quickly turned around <laughs> and left. Uh, what was unusual was that he decided to ask, and he was so concerned that we didn't invite any white people to our event. And What I really wanted to do was take him out on High Street and point him down in the direction of the other shops in the short north, uh, which are predominantly white owned, and arguably most of the people who attend Gallery Hop are white patrons, and asked him to tell, asked him to ask them if they invited any black people to their event. But I didn't do that. Um, and if you're wondering, there were no signs in our event saying no whites allowed, uh, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. But part of me understood how he felt, and it's something that we've all felt at some point in our life, you know, where we may have walked into a room or uh, this feeling of not belonging or, you know, this idea that you're not supposed to be in this place. And as I began to prepare this talk and think about uh, risk and what role does this feeling of not belonging and, how, you know, what happens when that becomes synonymous with our careers and our creativity and our livelihood and even our passion. Earlier in 2016, Richard Florida uh, wrote an article in The Atlantic talking about the racial division within the creative class. And in that article, he says, not only does the creative class skew white, but there are very few US cities where the black creative class is doing as well as their counterparts. Now, as a designer and entrepreneur, I can attest to this from experience and uh, both uh, from seeing it from a distance. I can recall in college, my freshman year of college, and uh, we were working on a uh, design project in one of our fundamental design classes. Probably about 20 to 25 students in the class. Four of us were African American, uh, which was unusual for a class. Uh, usually there's only one or two of us. And uh, one day our professor uh, pulled myself and the only two other African American young men in class aside to stay after class to help us with what he saw was our design problem with this project. Now, a lot of students were struggling with us and he chose to isolate us. But his solution was that to ask us not to put so much culture in our work and then to solicit the help of the other African-American young lady in the class who was being tutored by one of the white students. Now at the time, I really didn't understand what he was saying and I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't really understand what he was saying either, but his admonishment beyond uh, of us that day went beyond the classroom and it insinuated that our culture or my culture or culture period doesn't play a role in how we create and how we design and how we problem solve. And even further than that, that we can be present in body but not present in contribution to the thought and the creativity of that field. Now maybe he was saying we should design for a specific audience or you know, for a dominant culture. Um, but it didn't translate that way. And I had, you know, similar experiences throughout my college career uh, that, like that. But that doesn't just happen in college. What happens when you uh, journey into your professional career and you're trying to make alliances and build relationships and your peers don't see you? There was an instance of a design conference that happens here in the Midwest, a very popular one. 
And the organizers of that event were approached by a group of black designers and creatives around the lack of diversity that they saw in the speaker pool in the last few years in the vendor pool. And these organizers' response was, well, where are you guys and what are you doing? And so we have to ask what, it, what that implies when even your creative professional peers don't see you. Now, quite often it's easy to miss the nuance of race within the creative fields because we do so many things well. We talk about design thinking, we talk about creativity and uh, design and problem solving. We even talk about diversity and, uh, of ideas and diversity of perspectives and you know, equity and things like that. But often we lack the creativity to execute an action around true diversity. But how can you have true diversity of ideas and perspectives without diversity of people? In 1987, Cheryl D. Miller, a black designer, wrote an article for a print magazine, and she recently did a follow-up article this year for print. Um, and in that article, she talks about this experience of rejection. And in that, she says, you can't experience a great deal of rejection as a designer, as a black person. And you don't know if this is par for the course in a highly competitive business, or if it's something else, for instance, that you are a woman or that you just might not be good enough, or that you are black. Now, we all experience this type of rejection, and that's something that is, uh, happens to everybody. But as a black person or a person of color, you can never dismiss the notion that your race or ethnicity played a role. So if risk is a part of the work that we all have to do in our fields, and we indulge in risk every day when we make and create, we have to ask how we can use risk as our advocate in order to push our industries and the creative class forward to think about these things and how we're making uh, and who we involve in making. We talk a lot about making for the greater good. And so there are black creatives all over the place that are using risk as their advocate to change and push our industries to think about the things that we make and involving the people uh, that are on the fringes in making these things. For instance, to the question of where are you, we decided that we would answer that question by creating and developing our own conference that happens right here in Columbus, Ohio, called Creative Control Fest, where diversity, inclusion, and equity are at the root, at, at the mission of our, our endeavor, and we want to highlight the contributions of people of color and African Americans and creatives overall uh, that we aren't seeing in the mainstream. You also see uh, people like Maurice Cherry, who is archiving designers, black designers and developers on his podcast from all over the world and their contributions. Jacinda Walker, a recent graduate of Ohio State, uh, is doing some great scholarship around diversity within design disciplines and how we can all play a part in remedying the, these disparities. Now you may say to yourself, I'm not black or a creative professional. But this affects us all. We all participate in the, uh, the creative economy in some way, shape, or form. Um, we work in corporations and we purchase clothes and the makers are the people that make the things that we use every single day. And so we all have a part to play and the implications within the creative class go beyond the creative class. They are societal and systemic issues. And so we all have a role to play and we must first uh, acknowledge that this is a problem accept and honor the contributions of everybody. We are family members, we are creative professionals, we are all playing a part. James Baldwin has a, a saying that says, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed unless it is faced. I'll leave you by saying that we are all supposed to be here and we all can face and take this risk together. Thank you.